Welcome back to our workshop. Today I've got two examples of chairs with some severe damage. This one has a broken leg on it. And this one here has a broken upright on the back and it's broken in several different places. What I'm going to focus on is how to judge whether something can go back together or not. It's something that requires judgment and I'm going to walk you through step by step how to look at something and determine if you think it can be strong enough once it's repaired. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. What I need to do is take that apart, repair it, and put it back together so I can get this chair in working order. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. There are two ways to fix this chair. One is to make a whole new leg, but that means taking the chair apart and finishing that new part so it matches the chair. That takes a lot of skill. The other option is to glue this back together again, glue it properly, clamp it properly, and hopefully that's strong enough. But judging whether it's going to be strong enough is a really tough thing to do. To determine the strength of a joint, you really need to understand how glue works. So on grain, where you've got the side grain or long grain here, if you glue another piece long grain to that, it's very, very strong. That joint will be stronger than the wood fibers. This is all the end of the grain and end grain to end grain gluing there's virtually no strength at all. So if you look at this as basically a horseshoe shape, if I glue this back together again, all this area will have virtually no strength, but this area back here will. Now if I put this piece back on here and I bring the back over, on the back we've got side grain, face grain here, and when I put that on here, it's tempting to think that there's going to be a lot of strength here because of all this gluing surface. But again, the weakness in the back is right here. So if I were just to hold this up here, you can see the only strength in this back is going to be right here. The other part that's contributing to the weakness here is the tenon that comes in here. It's taken out a chunk of the wood, which is some of the strength. But that still doesn't explain to me why this would break off. I build furniture with North American wood and none of the wood I work with behaves this way. So this is definitely a wood species I'm not familiar with. To repair this, I'm going to replace the whole leg with a piece of birch. This chair has been well built. It's about two years old and I can't get these joints apart. So I've glued the corner blocks back in. The only thing left to do to salvage this chair is to work on repairing this joint. So I can't replace the leg. I talked to the customer and replacing the leg would get it to 100% strength. But repairing this joint, I think I can probably get it to 50% strength. And the customer's okay with that. They've got five other chairs. This is the sixth one. And they wanna make sure that this one is functioning, but understand that the only way to repair this really is to have a compromised joint. So I'm gonna show you how I go about and repair this and I'll show you the break in the other chair after I get some glue on this. If I just glue this up here, I think this is probably gonna provide about 30% of the strength of the original. So what I'm going to do is use something called a spline. I've got a piece of maple here, and what I'm gonna do is cut a slot through this break here and insert that into the slot and glue that together. And what that's doing is where I've got this break here, it's providing some structure, some long grain, across that broken joint. So with the tension pushed back on the chair, that will provide good gluing surface here and here to be able to provide additional support for the chair. I've replaced the dowel up here, so we're almost ready for the glue up. I'm gonna be using two different glues. I'm gonna be using epoxy here on the end grain. That's gonna give me strength that wood glue won't give me uh, in that particular spot. And for the rest of the areas, I'm using regular wood glue, but I'm testing out Tight Bonds Dark. Because I'm working with a dark finish here, if I use a regular PVA glue, you might see a little bit of ghosting where those glue lines are. Um, this one I'm testing out to see if it makes those glue lines a little less noticeable. Where the backsplat goes on here, there's also been a little bit of damage. So I'll bring this close so you can take a look. I've got some splits here that need to be able to glue back together again. So I'll get up my syringe, glue these up as I glue the chair back together again. Please give us a thumbs up so more people will see our videos. These syringes I use have blunt tips on them and you can replace the ends. Now the larger ones you can typically clean out, 
but the smaller ones are very hard to clean out with uh, PVA glue. And you can see here, if I pull this out and let it go, the air pressure is um, pulling it back in. So this one's been clogged, I have to replace it to get a finer tip. I've got a new tip here, so I'll just take off the old one, set it aside, and now load up some glue. I don't need that much. So just wipe the excess off, twist on the new tip, and we're ready to go. Now to get the glue in this crack, all I need to do is put some pressure on this dowel here to lift that joint open, and then inject the glue. Now I want that glue to go down into the crack, and you can see here in the end, I'll just demonstrate how that glue is going right in there. So get this loaded up on both sides, and then we can clamp it closed. Give it a squeeze here and test that we got some glue squeeze out. Perfect. Sometimes in an area like this where you can't get enough leverage with a dowel, it's best to stick a screwdriver in, and that gives you leverage to be able to open that crack to get the glue in. PVA glue needs clamping pressure to work properly. If you clamp it properly and glue it properly, the wood will be stronger than the wood fibers in the rest of the board. I'll mix up the epoxy first. It's a nice system here from West. It's a single pump of both of these components. Epoxy uh, works by chemical reaction. I'm using a silicone pot with a silicone stir stick because nothing sticks to silicone. And here's an example here of how hard epoxy is. Now this one has it isn't clear. It's had some um, additional stuff I've got called colloidal silica, which makes it thicker. Epoxy is the only type of glue that will have strength when there's a void between pieces. And that's why I'm using it on this end grain here to give me the strongest possible joint. To learn more about types of glue, check out our videos in the video description. So I'll set the glue pot here and it's the end grain here that I want to cover. And I won't be using a paintbrush for this because that means it's disposable. You can't reuse uh, brushes once you do this. So I like using the applicator. And what that means is, uh, because it's silicone as well, that the epoxy won't stick to it. So I can reuse the applicator again and again. It reduces waste in the workshop. Now, in addition to this end grain, I'm also going to apply it where the tenon attaches here, just to give it some potential extra strength to help hold it together. So we'll set this in place here, and then we can put the PVA glue on. Now, if I squeeze this together, you'll see the epoxy squeezing out. I've already pushed it once. But there's a little bit more there. I'll just clean that up before I put the clamps on it. There is a little spot of end grain here, so I'm just going to dab on some epoxy on that end, and then the rest comes down to PVA glue. So PVA is carpenter's glue, and as I said, this is a dark glue. Should give me a seam that's more concealed than regular carpenter's glue. And if you're interested in learning about different types of glue and strengths and weaknesses where you should and shouldn't be using them, I've got a video dedicated to that. I'll leave a link in the video description. Okay, the glue's on everything here, and it's time to assemble it. Put the back splat in here. And then start with the dowel in the far corner. Line up the parts here.
Okay, and now I can clamp it up. The critical part to line up is down here and up here because this wants to slide down. So I'm going to clamp it on most of this surface here and just leave a little bit here. I can judge how that's lining up. And then add another clamp up here. You see how we've got some good glue squeeze out there? That's exactly what we want to make sure we're going to have a nice strong joint. I'll just feel this here. Yep, I've got a nice transition between those two pieces. The surfaces are level. So I'll just wipe up the glue and let it dry. I'll move this off to the side here and I'll bring up this other chair. So this chair has a broken leg on it. And when I looked at this with the customer, I said, there's no way that that's going to go back together again. And let me tell you why. The first thing I noticed when I got this chair was it's a very small piece of wood on this leg. If I measure it, I've got three quarters of an inch here and an inch and a half here. Three quarters of an inch, that's extremely thin for something that has to hold up hundreds of pounds. If you think about the pressure that's going to be on this, especially if it's being moved on carpet, um, there's a lot of strain on that. The other part when I looked at it was there's a couple of milling marks in here that are kind of odd. So let me turn the chair upside down and we'll take a look at what's going on. Here you can see in the corners, these legs are being held on by bolts and these ones are really, really loose. And this is typical of what's called flat packed furniture. It's something that's easily shipped and assembled by the customer. Unfortunately, these chairs don't tend to last that long. This is where the leg broke off and you can see there's a section that's missing out here. And that section is the dowel that holds this piece to the leg. Now that's typical woodworking joinery, but can you see that shiny part in there? Let me get you a little closer. You can take a look. These coarse threads in here are an insert nut and they get threaded into the wood so that you can thread in a bolt and the bolt is right here. And you can see there's a pocket in here. And that would have been a large hole drilled to get that insert nut in, but unfortunately it was drilled really deep. So if you take the, that amount of wood there out of this piece of wood, and then you take that dowel out, there's not much grain here that's holding on the existing piece of wood around this area. The other part of the puzzle here is the orientation of the grain. When you build a chair leg, the grain needs to be as straight as possible because that long grain is what's providing the strength. If you were to build a chair where all the grain was going this way, it could fairly easily break. Now, when I look at this, I'm a little bit puzzled because the grain is going this direction. You can see that's quite a steep angle here, but here we've got some end grain. Now, just to appreciate how much wood was actually cut out here, I'm gonna color this with a Sharpie and you can see what's left. Be sure to go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter for links to new videos, workshop tips, and more. Now back to fixing furniture. So well, it looks like on the outside we've got a three quarter inch piece of wood. Look over here. It's about a quarter of an inch all the way up there. Very little on the top, about a quarter of an inch there. This really was not a strong leg. Now you can understand why I told the customer this can't get glued back together again. So how do you fix something like this? Well, you can take the back off, it just unbolts, and then you need to take the upholstery off and the padding off, then take the back apart make a whole new leg, put the padding back on, put the upholstery back on, then stain the leg to match. And while putting them back together again, changing this joinery a little bit so it's not going to be as compromised. That's a lot of work and the customer doesn't want to go through that. So unfortunately, this chair is going to the landfill. One thing that puzzles me though is why I'm seeing some wood that's being broken like this on such weird angles I'm not quite familiar with this type of wood. It's not from North America. Um, so what I'm gonna do is take this chair apart a little bit more and investigate this wood because it really puzzles me. By looking at the break from this angle, you can see how unnecessary that hole was to get drilled in here. 
This insert nut's only three quarters of an inch, but it looks like it was drilled in probably an inch and a quarter into the wood. Let's see what's inside. Well, this is interesting. There's a crack here in the wood. There's a crack up here in the wood. This is really brittle material. I'll strip off the rest of this fabric and we'll see what's going on with the rest of the frame. Now that you can see the full frame here, in addition to the cracks over here, I also see a split here. And look how long the split is. It goes from here all the way to here. That's along the grain. And this is where this chair should be the strongest, is along that grain line. I'm not able to identify this wood. It's not North American. And I'm hoping you, my viewers around the world, can help identify it. Wood identification is difficult, so I'll give you a few close-ups so you can see the grain pattern in the wood. And it's relatively light, but when I try to put my thumbnail in it, it's really hard. It's not like it's a softwood. I'm going to use the card scraper on here just to see what the grain looks like. There's a whole bunch of grain orientation here that's changed. And that would explain why this is on an angle instead of being straight this way. I bet if I were to scrape this side down, we'd see a similar thing. So if I put this brake back together, now that the finish is off it, you can see there's a huge knot here. So the combination of that huge knot where the grain's going all over the place, you should never do this in furniture, plus all that wood that was taken out in there from the joinery, this joint didn't stand a chance. Well, I really hate to say it, but the right spot for this furniture is in the landfill. Now, as I was filming this, another piece of furniture got dropped off and look what's happening here. Insert nuts are pulling this wood apart. So another puzzling break on this wood, pieces being this dimension should never behave that way. But I've got enough of the pieces here, I think I might be able to glue it back together. But first, let's get back to this chair. I can take the clamps off this now. It's important when you glue things up that you not only let the glue dry, but you let it cure as well. So with the epoxy that I use, it can be one to three days. With the PVA, it's usually 24 hours. So check on your glue bottles because there is a difference between dry time and cure time. The reason I need this at full strength is the next step for me is to take a slot cutter and cut a slot in here. So I'll get this mounted in the router and this has a bearing guide and will allow me to get a slot in there so I can insert a spline and reinforce that break. Here's another tip for you too. When you're using PVA on finished surfaces, the glue can't stick to the surface. So here you see it just scratches off. So there's no need to mask off joints when you're gluing on both PVA. When you've got epoxy, you need to make sure you're cleaning them up as you go. That was down here. But this stuff just wipes right off. A little bit of uh, water on this. I can just clean that right up. I'm going to run the router across the surface here and cut the slot across the brake here. This is the end grain brake, the one I want to reinforce. And in order to do that, I've got some padding on the bench and a clamp here and here. And that just gives me the stability that I can put a little bit of force here. The chair is going to stay in place and I can get through that cut safely. Now, cutting a slot like this is really effective, but it's really dusty. So I'm gonna clean up here, let the dust clear in the air, and then come back and we'll put a spline in.
I fit the spline in here, so it's got a nice tight fit. But on the inside here, you can see the tenon at the end of the slot. So I want to make sure I've got good glue contact at the back of the spline here. So what I'm going to do is use epoxy to get it in there. So if there does happen to be a void, then that epoxy is going to take up that void and provide strength to that whole joint. Now before I glue this together, because I'm going to use epoxy, I'm going to work on the other leg because if I need epoxy there, I can use one batch for both of these. Let's take a closer look at these two legs here and see what's wrong with them. Now this one, I'll bring it closer, you can see there's a piece of wood missing out of it. And there's also a crack across the top here. And a crack down here, but it stops right there. On this side, comes down and ends here. On this piece, I have two parts that the customer brought in. This one goes in here. And this one goes in here. So if I glue this back together again, this should be strong enough to hold because I've got a good connection between this part and this part. And when PVA glue is glued and clamped properly, that bond will be stronger than the rest of the wood fibers in the leg. So I know by gluing this up that this won't break again on that crack. Now, this seems like pretty weak wood, so there's nothing preventing another crack from forming and that breaking out. But that's how I'm going to solve this problem, is regluing it. This one, on the other hand, we need a solution for that. To cut out the cracked wood here, I need to make a jig. I'm going to use a table saw to cut a cut from underneath here. So I need to cut this on a 45 degree angle, cutting it through the saw. I've got some angled pieces here from the scrap bin. I'm going to put this jig together so that I can safely hold this leg in one piece, move it through the saw all at once, and that way I can make a nice straight cut up through here, straight enough that I can glue another board to it. The fastest way to make jigs like this is to use an accelerator with a CA glue. So I'm just going to put the CA glue in here, and I've used mine a fair bit, so I've worn down the tip. And then put this in place. This glue is great because it only takes about 10 to 15 seconds to dry, and you're good to go. If you're using it without the accelerator, it takes about a minute to dry. So you can see here, I've got a nice snug fit in here. I'm just going to drive one screw through here and we'll be ready to go. So I'll bring this over to the saw, and I need to set the saw blade height. There's some wear marks here from where it attaches to the chair, so I want to be a little bit lower than that. And then I need to take the bolt out, and the insert nut as well. Now, this is moving up here at the top, so I just need to add a little extra blocking that I can clamp on here to keep it stable. And then line it up, and we're good to go. With this cut here, I now need to cut the bottom. And rather than cutting it off square where I've got a butt joint, that's the weakest possible joint I can have in connecting pieces of wood, I'm gonna cut it on a slight angle here. And that will give me a little bit of an angle that will help prevent that wood from wanting to pull out and will give me a stronger glue bond as well. A 
pull a piece of birch out of the scrap pile here. Here's one. And this scrap has a 45 degree angle on the end of it, so I can just put it here. And I can tell by eyeballing it, it's not a 45 degree angle. So I'm just going to make a couple of cuts to get it closer to the angle, and then I can get it dead on. So I just trimmed this off, it's a little shorter, easier to work with. And as I inspect it, there's a small void right here on the tip. And there's a small void right in here. What I'm going to do is use epoxy to put this block on. Otherwise, it's got a really good fit on this angle on both sides here and on that face. So it's a good thing I held off on using the epoxy. So I'll put it on this one and the chair back. And then this other piece here, we'll just go together with PVA glue. Now, just to show you how hard this epoxy is from West System, this is my silicone cup. And this is dried from the last glue up. And the nice thing about using a silicone cup is you can reuse it again and again, and you're not having to use disposable products in the workshop. So there's epoxy, and listen to how hard it is. It's as hard as a hockey puck. Actually, harder than a hockey puck. So that's why when you've got a void, uh, epoxy is the right glue because it will hold. Uh, you can't get that power out of a PVA glue or even a CA glue. So um, I'll leave links to each of these products I use in the video description. Uh, Starbond has a promotion on. You get um, a percentage off when you use the link as well. Epoxy is dried on all these pieces. What I'm going to do is just take the clamps off. And what I'm going to do is focus on these legs first to get them out of the way. And then finish up with the spline on the chair. The joint here came together well. And all I need to do now is trim off these blocks. This whole area is hidden by the upholstery. So you'll never see that. So I don't need to worry about staining. It's just getting it into the right shape and putting those insert nuts back in. I'll put it in this way. I've got some pre-made wedges that I use a fair bit in my repairs. So it's just a matter of getting them in the right spot here, lifting this up above the surface of the vise, and then clamping it down. The other thing I want to do is protect the surface here because this part here won't be visible. I don't want to be adding scratches to the finished piece. So I'll add tape on here and that just protects the surface from getting scratched. I'm cutting off the majority of this waste with a handsaw and then I'll finish off with a plane. Now I've used my jack plane to get it down almost level to the surface here. I'm peeling back the tape now and I've got my smoothing plane. It's a smaller plane and what I'm going to do is line it up right here on the edge and just go this way gently. Again, I don't want to be marring the surface. So I just need to be very careful with this as I go across and make the cuts. Another way to do this is with a flush cut saw putting tape on either side here so it's slightly raised and then working your way through the block. So that gets relatively close. Actually, it's perfectly flush at the front here. I did wear away some of that tape. 
and under here I've got a little bit of a lip to work down with a plane. Using these two methods there is a difference in the accuracy. This is the one I use the hand plane on and you can see it's perfectly square. Whereas if I go to this side here with the flush cut saw it was good to start with but it created a bit of a gap. Now it's not material for this because this is the connection point here to the furniture so we're good here but using those two different methods the plane is much more accurate. The last step is to cut off this lip at the top here and it's relatively easy on a miter saw but on a tapered leg you need to make sure that you're not working on the tapered side you need the flat side down against the fence and against the base here so you can make that cut accurately. I've got a 45 degree jig I use on my table saw and that's perfect for working on a corner like this. I can just put the two parts in here and then I can measure for where the center of these holes need to be. I found the best way to install insert nuts is to do it a little bit at a time and to use a low clutch setting on the drill. So if I pull it backwards, drive it forwards, what I'm doing is I'm cutting new threads in there. I'll back it out. I'll finish turning them in by hand. I don't want to overdo it. This way I can gauge how much pressure there is. So there we go. With one chair out of the way, we can get to the back splat and the spline. Now first I'm going to protect the sides here as I work through this. I'm going to be using a chisel here and this will just give me a little insurance in case the chisel slips we might have a bit of a nick. I've learned that it's just best to try and avoid disasters like that. It just creates more work. So when you're working through something like this, it's important to understand the direction of the grain. The grain pattern here is running what's called downhill. It's this way. So if I cut the direction of the grain, the wood will come off easily. If I try to go uphill, the chisel just wants to dig in. So I'm going to take some heavy cuts here. And get rid of the bulk. I'm just sanding with some 220 to level the rest of these areas out here and get that wood smooth. It's really odd how rough that wood feels. It just almost doesn't want to sand smooth. So I'm using a 220 sand, grit sandpaper here. And I think I've got it mostly smoothed out, but let me move up to a 320. Let's see if we can get it nice and flat. Okay, that's feeling a little better. Actually, in the finish here, I can see that there's some rough wood under the finish. So, yeah, it's very strange wood. On this side here, things look pretty good. There's a little bit of a lip right here. And on this side, there's a little bit of a lip right here. It's smooth down here. So I have a little bit more sanding to do here. And then we can get to touch-ups. So you can see there's quite a difference in color from up here to this is the original color here. This is the original color here. And this is what I put in here. There's, um, so what I need to do is blend that a little bit. And also in here, I've got some light points. So with a grading marker, what you can do is put a streak through here. And as you add more grain in it, really depends on the type of 
wood and, and wood grain you're dealing with. But what it can do is fool the eye into thinking that there's wood grain there and it just becomes less noticeable. Now if we get this in the right light you can see there's a slight void across here and there's a slight void at the end of the spline. I'm going to fill that with burn-in wood filler once I get a top coat on here. I put four quarts of lacquer on here and it's got a nice sheen. I sanded halfway through and I've got this little depression here and here I need to fill. And then I'll put one more coat of lacquer on. And if you noticed, I use this handle. This goes onto any spray can and it's an inexpensive tool, but it makes spraying much easier. I'll leave a link in the video description. These are burn-in sticks. They're a great way to fill in voids with different colors. And if you want to learn how to use one of these, I've got a video on that. I'll leave a link in the video description. So there's the voids filled. I just need to put a top coat on now. Before I wrap up the video, I'll show you some close-ups of these pieces here and this finished chair. But before I do, I want to share with you my next project. I'm pretty excited about this. These are two mid-century modern chairs, and they were previously repaired in the 80s. They've got a few problems with the joints, so that'll present a couple of challenges. So I hope you subscribe, and you can get notified of when this video comes out. So as a close-up, you can see there's still a break here and here. But for the most part, when you look at it from a distance, it disappears. If you are wanting perfection on a finish like this, you'll have to strip the whole piece down and restain it and refinish it. I'll move this around here and you can see the spline is concealed and it should be at least 50% the strength of the original piece. The back splat will be 100%. This part I put together with PVA glue and it'll be nice and strong. And you can see I touched up the finish at the bottom. And on this leg, because there were slight voids between the two pieces of wood, I used epoxy, and that makes sure I've got a 100% bond between those pieces of wood. It's all smoothed out and ready to go. It's 100% the strength of the original. Judging the strength of the repair is difficult to do, but I hope these three examples give you some hints in terms of what to look for so you can make that judgment yourself. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. That tells YouTube it's a quality video and will help grow our channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, please click over here and click on the bell icon to get notified every time we publish a video. Thanks for watching Fixing Furniture. <music>